Om Shanti. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday night talk. This event is hosted by Anubhuti Retreat Center, which is run by Brahma Kumaris, the World Spiritual Organization. And tonight is uh, the topic of emotional detox. Living in this world, we gather different types of emotions and we make ourselves heavy. And what happens is we are then unable to move freely in our relations or while doing any work also. We carry this heaviness in our work, in our relations, in our interactions. So it is very important to, to let go of that heaviness so that we can become light and free. Sister Kim, our facilitator today, is going to tell us how we can let go, how it can become light. Uh, she is a PhD in clinical psychology and is a very experienced uh, meditator uh, of Raj Yoga for past seven years. And so let us all welcome her uh, so that she can uh, guide us into this uh, very important uh, teaching. Thank you, brother. Om Shanti to everyone and good evening. And let's just take a moment. I know some of you have come from work or <clears throat> it's the end of the day. And uh, just take a moment to turn within and relax. And when we relax our body, our mind tends to also follow and relax. So let's just take a couple of breaths. Just natural breaths. I'll let you do that on your own. And focus your attention inside of yourself, away from the world, away from what you see, what you hear. You do see, you see the screen, you see me, you see the pictures in the background. But if you could see yourself behind your eyes as a tiny star, that is sparkling as a beautiful light. And brother was talking about being light, not being heavy. So just allow your burdens of the day to just fall off your shoulders and just empty out your mind. You think, but you don't have to worry about what you're thinking. Just let go and just relax and just be. Be accepting of yourself exactly as you are in this moment. And think about freedom. What does freedom feel like? Freedom is a gift that you give to yourself, that you create through your thoughts, your feelings, your words, your attitude, your perception, your perspective. And think about the two words, stay awake, stay awake. What does that mean to you? You are a soul, a spirit, a being of light, immortal. You never die. Someday you will leave this body of flesh and bones. But you, the soul, will fly off on to another journey, continuing your journey. And... 
to be on the journey in the present moment, you want to think of yourself as wine, light, unburdened, not heavy, in the awareness of who you are. And who you are is a beautiful being of light, a child of the highest source of energy, who you may want to call God, or perhaps you may want to just say the source, the higher power, whatever you feel comfortable with but allow that loving presence, that energy to be with you in this present moment and allow yourself to feel like a child who's being embraced in that comfort. Some say that he is the great physician and if we didn't have some of these negative emotions and these negative patterns going on in our life, then why would we need this great physician in our life? There's a reason. We need that energy for healing, for transformation on this journey so that at the end we can just fly away like a bird that goes home so light, so free, so unencumbered, just being me, the soul. So let's talk about these negative emotions. And um, I want you to keep a thought, just think for a moment, what is a negative emotion that keeps cropping up in your life? They say that something will come in different forms until you resolve it or you neutralize it within yourself, inside of yourself. And so if you could think of something that's come through different people, different relationships, different circumstances, it could be at work, it could be um, in uh, with your sister, with your brother, with your parents, anyone. And just think how this, this theme kind of keeps coming back in your life. And just uh, hold that thought and uh, we will go into a little bit more about negative emotions. So I'm going to keep it pretty simple because negative emotions is so broad and it can be a little overwhelming to try to cover too much in one hour. But I think the key word of emotional detoxing, detoxing is to change, to have, the, to have the hope, to have the, to know that the potential is within you to change. And it might take some effort. It might take a little work. And um, it's been explained to me as an example. Of course, I'm much older now, but I do go to the gym. So I get it that if you want to have a six pack, well, you can't just have a six pack by wishing for a six pack. You have to put in the physical work. And so spiritually, this is a program of spirituality, not religion. It's for everybody. It's universal. And there's concepts that are applicable to all the religions, everyone in the world, regardless of how you were raised, what religion you're in, what country you're in. Um, we don't look at that. We look at the fact that we're all beings of light and we all come from the same home and that we all have the potential to be who we are, which is a loving, free being who came on to this earth or came into this body as completely beautiful, unafraid, um, full of energy, um, hopeful, fun, 
and um, creative. And so uh, I want you to think about remembering, remembering that small child of who you were before perhaps the fears were um, introduced to you of don't fall, don't go there. Um, I'm worried about you. Uh, you know, all those things that we've picked up over the years, the feelings of low self-esteem, perhaps maybe some trauma has happened in your life. And maybe there's been some hurts and hangups that are underlying deep down beneath those negative emotions. And so when we focus on the world, we get into a state of unawareness because we're trying to solve the problems of our life with things out there. Like, um, oh, I'll be happier if I fall in love or um, it's expected of me to get married and have a family. That's the answer. Now I need to get a career. Now I need to um, make money. Now I need to buy a house. Now I need to have a child. And so we're expected, perhaps, by people that are close to us to follow this program. And we are conditioned. We are conditioned to make other people happy. And so we start looking around as small children and we start figuring out what people want from us and we start going outside of ourselves and we start changing ourselves to be who they want us to be, maybe forgetting who we really are. And so I want you to think about becoming aware and waking up, coming into the consciousness of who you are. But we forget who we are and we go back to the other of who we think you want us to be because we get caught up in thinking about what you think about us or me. I'll talk about myself. I get caught up in and it could be totally like imaginary, you know, it's not really happening, but something in my past is triggering me or, or a memory comes up or I associate something that you've said, but I'm not really aware in that moment that it's that old feeling of not feeling good enough, or maybe you don't like me. And we can get all the degrees, we can make all the money, we can have all the things, we can have the relationship, we can have the kids, the cars, vacations. But inside of us, there seems to be a universal nagging of maybe I'm not quite enough. And if you really knew me as I am, you might not like me. So let's just think about a negative emotion that comes up again and again, a theme, a thread, a common thread that seems to run through each one of our lives, depending upon our own unique journey. And have you thought about it? Have you looked inside and tried to trace back to the root of it, that thorn that kind of pricks you again and again, unexpectedly? Well, part of spirituality is being honest and looking within ourselves. And there seems to be this shadow that we call the shadow, this personal shadow land that each one of us have and it's kind of like, you know, the light's not turned on and we're back in the dark thoughts or we're in the waste thoughts or negative thoughts about ourselves. or why did she say that? Why doesn't she like me? Um, and we go over it again and again and again, but it's really tied back to that conditioning that's happened over and over again in our life. 
and we can't blame anyone. I mean, maybe chances are you've, people have insulted you, said things that are rude, said things that were hurtful. But all we can do is do something about our own thoughts. We can't control other people. They have the freedom to say what they want based upon their own perceptions, their own imagination, their own triggers. Or maybe they're just sometimes jealous or envious or competitive. These things come up. But we have to know how to deal with it so that we don't cause harm to ourselves. We don't take the poison. Because what the higher power, the source, God, is teaching us in Raj Yoga is that what may be difficult to see is what we need to get in touch with. We need to be aware that there are things under the surface, deep down, that prick us. There's thorns. And they, they cause us to harm ourselves. They cause us to poison our soul. And when we're meditating, we're trying to take in the nectar. We're trying to take in like the sunlight of the spirit is like a metaphor for taking in the energy of God, sitting in God's presence, um, this invisible energy, this love, this peace, just sitting like in the ocean and taking it in and giving love and having the love, you know, just, it just goes back and forth. These vibrations, this goodness, this, this sense of being accepted, this sense of being, a, being loved for exactly who you are in this moment. And even though you have this thorns, this great being loves you. He understands you. He knows where these thorns are from, but sometimes we can't quite see it and the more we sit in meditation the more these things kind of bubble up over time it takes a long time but some things will just come out you won't even expect it like a memory of something you did that wasn't quite right and then you have to sit with it and then the ocean of love just bathes you and it's nothing that's sad, but there's no judgment. It's me that judges myself. God doesn't judge me. It's I do it to myself. And then when I get triggered, um, when I can get honest with myself and let it come up, I can deal with it. And when I deal with it, I'm not suppressing it anymore. It's been brought up to me, which is an indication to me that I'm ready to deal with it and that it's presenting itself as an opportunity and that God is reassuring me through our relationship without saying it, that, hey, you have the capacity to do this. You know, when a tree grows or a flower grows, there's everything has to be there for that potential to happen. You know, the sunlight, pulling out the weeds, keeping the dirt right, you know, um, just loving that plant, loving the tree. Everything has to be balanced for that tree to grow and that flower to grow, for that flower to bloom. And it's the same thing with us. We have that potential. We just have to dig in and keep that balance, keep that faith, and believe in ourselves. And when we do that, we give ourselves hope. And that is a huge thing to give ourselves hope and to turn on that light and keep that light on and use spiritual knowledge to guide us 
and develop our relationship more with that higher power through love, through love for ourselves. And so I need to let go of my flaws. Now, how do I do that? So I have to first believe that I can make a change in myself through experience. I have to be willing to look within and get honest with myself. And I have to be unafraid that I'm on this path of discovering, uncovering, and discarding. And so to find this contentment and this happiness, I have to be open to another perspective besides my own. And so the other perspective is a spiritual perspective. It's not a religious perspective. It's a spiritual perspective. It's a way of living. It's a new way of life. And so to live in this new way of life, I have to think differently, act differently, behave differently, to stay awake, to stay present, and keep looking within. And so I think I want to use an example, and I hope that you're thinking about your example. Keep that in, keep that in your mind that I'm going to think of a time that someone said something hurtful to me and it hurt my feelings. Now, why did it hurt my feelings? And why can I not just let it blow past me? Why was there such an impact on me and why did I take the poison and cause myself more harm? Well, I thought back on an example and I thought about why that impacted me so much. And it, I had to get down to the roots of why it impacted me. And it impacted me so much because There's been harmful things that have said to me several times, not to blame anyone. I'm not blaming, I'm not justifying, I'm not making myself a victim. But things do happen early on where things are said to us that are hurtful by different institutions or maybe our parents. You know, they did the best they could. They do the best they could, they can. And so it goes back to the feeling that why am I needing others' approval so much? Think about that. Why am I so caught up in what they think about me? And why am I so worried about it? that I'm sitting there ruminating over it and over again on why this person doesn't like me. And what does this say about how I think about myself sometimes? And the script that I give to others that you should be acting in a certain way, you shouldn't be saying that to me. Now, is that not giving others the freedom. They have the freedom to say whatever they want to say. So I'm giving them a script and they're not following it. And so the other thing that I thought about was ambition. What it is, what it is that I want. Do I want them to see me as a good person? Do I want them to see me as a, you know, the perfect BK or, you know, or um, the perfect student, you know, these things that uh, perfectionism, right? And this follows us into our spiritual path. 
it doesn't just go away. It's something that we continuously have to be uncovering. These feelings, these things that happened in our life that are deeply buried in our subconscious that maybe we don't even, we're not even aware of. Because before we came here, we were trying to get our needs met through the outside world, through our senses. But now we're looking within and we're dealing with ourself and our own journey and how to change so that we can be happy and content and not give our power to someone else and give my power away so that I lose my peace of mind because of something that really I could have imagined or I made bigger than it really is because it triggered something from the past. It triggered something that I'm not really aware of. And I need to bring that into my awareness so that I can uncover it and discard it. And I can sit in meditation and just let that love come in and that peace and that acceptance until I feel that love for myself. You know, my career was um, the last part of my life. I've been a nurse. I've been um, a mother. <laughs> I was a stay-at-home mother for 10 years before I went back to school. And even though I have a PhD in psychology, that does not mean I have it all together because I can tell you there's several people <laughs> in my field that we can look good, but that doesn't mean we have it all together. We still, we all have hurts and hangups. And sometimes we focus too much on helping other people instead of helping ourselves. We have those blind spots. And so God has come to tell us that you know, those blind spots are what's causing you to take that poison in. And you need to uncover that. You need to recover it from it and you need to discard it. You need to let it just blow past you because it has those forces, those negative forces are very powerful. But first we have to identify what they are. It can't just be some nebulous thing in our mind like, oh, the vices. You know, what does that mean? What does that mean? I'm not going to get angry. Well, of course, we're human. We're going to feel anger at times. If we saw a child being abused in front of us or a dog being kicked, we would feel something. We're not robots. But I don't have to react. I can see it for what it is and discern if there's anything I need to do about it. Is there any action I need to take? keep my mind clear-headed and be stable and balanced. And so meditation opens up a whole new possibility to having a mind that's not cluttered. It's not filled with what is and whys and self-doubt. Self-doubt is a big one. And I know that each person probably, I don't want to, I just think that probably everybody I've talked to on my journey has had moments of self-doubt or moments of not feeling good enough or perfectionism or something, something eats at us. This is why we're here to try to figure it out, to try to let it go, to try to have that peace of mind, that happiness, that contentment. So we don't have to wait for a heaven on earth. We can create heaven in our mind right here, right now. But we have to take it a drop at a time because there's all these negative emotions from the past. And maybe for me, I'm 65. So there's a whole lot of years of taking the poison and um, trying to look good. You know, I thought that if I got a PhD, that that was going to be it. You know, I was going to have enough money. I was going to be somebody. I was going to be, um, I know this sounds weird, but <laughs> for me, um, 
I've always not had a competition with women, but more of a competition with men. I know that sounds very strange, but I don't have sisters. I come from very strong father who um, he's not, he's deceased now, but uh, really pushed me, really pushed me to be something, to believe in myself. But on the other hand, he was kind of, you know, hard on himself and kind of hard on me, I think, you know, he had a hard time being kind of nurturing. And so I had these, what looked like confidence, but underneath it, I had these thorns that said, maybe you're not good enough, you know, and maybe you're just not, if they really knew all your problems and what was really going on in your life, they would tell you, you're not fit to be a therapist. So I think that um, when you hide those things and you don't deal with them, they cause you to not be open and not to really be compassionate, your full compassionate self. And I'm going to give you just an example. I have to keep the time here so I don't run over, but this is, um, I just want you to think about yourself, like how we try to look good for the world and how we put on that mask and we're afraid to take it off and be vulnerable and really think about that, you know, just like being that little child, you know, that crawls up into her daddy's lap or her, you know, God's lap and just says, here I am, here I am, Papa. And I know you love me. I didn't used to think you loved me because I thought I was bad, you know, and I just want you to think about, I'm going to be really honest because I think honesty is what helps to get us well. I really do. And yeah, I've got this uniform on and, and I'm on this spiritual quest, but that doesn't mean I have it all together. I'm on a journey and I won't be. I won't have everything together until maybe the end, but I'm going to share with you that it's such a, it's such a weird thing to look at degrees and think that that person's got it all together. You know, people project things onto us that is almost unfair, you know? And I had to learn to get really, really honest and to really, really like let things go. But I had an imagined life of that I was married and I had the car and I had the kids and my kids were going to be like this. And I had my whole future planned out. And it couldn't have gone more different. It could not have gone more different. And I was going to be in private practice and I was going to have money and I was going to have status and, and, uh, and it, that could not be more, <laughs> gone more different. Um, I wanted to be a teacher at a university and I did not want to stay in Fresno. This was not where I was supposed to be. I came here to go to school and then I was leaving like everybody else I went to school with. Well, that didn't happen. And then I thought my kids were going to graduate and they were going to go on their lives and be, you know, just regular, normal things, you know, that didn't happen. And then when I went to go get my hours, to get my license, which by the way, I never got. Um, I have a PhD, I did graduate, but I didn't get my license. So a lot of things did not end up the way I thought they would. I went five years into the county and the position that I went for to get my hours for my license which I did achieve, I did stay there for five years, was for a position in adult, adult um, treatment. 
But then when I got to that interview, the person that was interviewing me said, this is, I'm so sorry, this has been a mistake. The advertisement was not uh, accurate. And the position is for juvenile delinquency. And I thought, wow, wow, I've been doing that my, you know, as a therapist in my graduate school, you know, and I've been doing that with my master's to make money so I could support my family. I didn't say anything, but inside I thought, wow, God, this is really humorous. I wanted to get out of this and now you're putting me right back into it. And not only that, but the other joke was my son was locked up. Now, isn't this great? Now I have to go. Not only did one son get locked up, but the other one got locked up right after him. So now I have to go to the probation school with my degree of wanting to look good to the place where my son had gone to do his aftercare. And so now I'm worried that they're going to recognize me. They're going to know me. They're going to know that I'm a loser as a mom, that my life is a loser, and they're not going to want me. And I'm terribly like insecure about this. So this is how God has worked in my life. And it could not have worked out more beautifully for me. I don't know how the kids felt about it that I worked with, but it could, it could not have worked out better for me because it blew my cover. And nobody recognized me. Nobody knew until one day, one of my son's buddies came to the campus. And he said, oh, wow, it's Jonathan's mom. And everybody heard it. And they said, how do you know him? And he said, oh, well, you know, I'm buddies with, you know, her son and her son got out of it. And he's, you know, I'm so glad for him, but I'm still in it, you know. And he was there to get some papers and try to get out of his sentence, you know, go before the judge and look good and try to get a reduced sentence. So my cover was blown. I was exposed. And, you know, it goes back to that thread that I was talking about of how that pride, you know, that pride, that ego, that I need you to think of me as a certain way. And now, oh God, I'm totally deflated. You know, I'm totally like, oh my Lord. So it didn't stop there. God is so, he has such humor, you know, and he just going to get us to our potential one way or another. And the reason I'm talking about this is because of negative emotions. You know, we can be so hard on ourselves. But actually, when I looked at doing this tonight on negative emotions, I had to like look within and kind of get deep again on what do I, what do I want to say? How honest do I want to get? And why can't I just be myself? Why do I have to look a certain way or sound a certain way? Because I'm sure that there's one person that has felt this way and said, oh my gosh, you know, I need to like, just let things go. You know, I need to uncover a little bit, get a little bit more vulnerable, expose myself a little more, you know? And sometimes it's just a matter of letting go of perfectionism. So one, I'm going to talk about this emotional detox, and this is a really powerful example. This is not in my life, but I had a client. I want you to think about this, how powerful this is, because this is the root, the root of the thoughts, the behaviors, the words. And even though this is a 16-year-old, who's in trouble with the law, who's locked up in placement, who's been extremely violent. Um, I have these kids in group and she's just 
yelling at this girl and she's been so abusive to this girl who is really sweet and she's not a gang member but she's actually an abuse uh, she's had um, years of abuse but she's in a placement because there's nobody that wants her and this gang member girl, she keeps being so mean to her. You know, she wants, she's hit her behind Steph's back. She's just on her. She's yelling at her in the group. And I thought, what is it? What is going on between these two? You know, what is this dynamic? What is, help me, you know, I, in the time I was in this, another spiritual program. And I said, God, help me. I just, I can't pull, but I, I can't pull out the book knowledge. This has got to come from something. You got to help me. What's going on here that I can help this girl? You stop hurting this other girl, you know? And I said to her, what is it that this girl is triggering in you? What is it that she's reminding you of? You know, just, I just want to know what's going on here. And she stopped. And I mean, just put yourself in this girl's shoes. I mean, I'm sure we have all felt this, like, what is going on here? Why is this person triggering me so much? You know, why does this keep coming on in my life? Why am, why is my karma repeating over and over again? <laughs> I can't get to the root of it. And she yelled at this girl and she said, I hate you. I hate you. And we all got really quiet. And she said, why do you hate me? Why do you hate me so much? And she said, because you, you're always crying and blubbering about what happened to you. And, and I'm just sick of it. And so she, then she started crying. She just started crying so hard. And she said, you remind me of that girl. It's so powerful. It just hits me to this day. You remind me of that girl when my gang members were raping her. And I was the lookout when she was screaming and crying. And I just stood there and I turned my back on her and I and when you cry, I can hear her saying, please, no, shut up. Just, you know, just shut up, shut up. I don't want to hear your screaming. And it was that guilt. It was that shame. And this little girl looked out to her and she said, I love you. I love you. And the other girl said, please forgive me. And isn't that like so like how souls will touch and they can get so honest and so they're so broken, but if they can get to that honesty in that moment, it's just like a little drop. Now that girl went on and she, I'm sorry to say she did violate again and she got violent and we had to terminate her placement and she probably had to go on to some place that wasn't very fun, but it's drop by drop. You know, we're not going to be fixed overnight. We're not going to be fixed in one, one meditation session, you know, one study. It's got to be repeated over and over again until we get it. And we say, okay, I got it. Now I need to drop the rock. I need to drop it. Like I'm, I'm not going to sit in the shame anymore. I'm not going to hate myself anymore or, or have that doubt or wish it was different. This is my journey. This is what's happened to me. And I can become strong and I can learn lessons from it and I can help someone else. If it's just being kind or not judging them are not criticizing them. You know, isn't that really what God is all about? Isn't that really being his hand and foot in this world, his foot soldier on this earth is to 
just extend a smile and ex extend a hand that says, you know, I've been there and, and you can change. You can change your perception. You can have a spiritual solution. You know, and I went to church so many years. I had so much scripture. You know, I could put on the robe. I could put on the cross. I could be in the choir. You know, I could teach Sunday school. I could lead women's groups. I could be the facilitator. But a lot of times inside that shame would still hit that if they really knew, they might not like me. And so I've carried this through my whole life, you know, and it just reminds me of those two girls face to face saying, I love you. I forgive you. Just a drop, just a drop. And so just staying awake, staying present, looking within and letting God in letting God in because when I'm in my negative emotions and I'm in my self-doubt and my pride my anger I block him off I block him off and sometimes I think that the source kind of leaves me alone so that I can turn back within and, and look inside and dig around and uncover. And then when I uncover and I get a little bit more humble, that source comes right back in. And he lets me know that I know where you're at. I'm not judging you. I'm not criticizing you, but I might step back so that you can get a little bit more perspective, get a little bit more humble because I'm in my way not God, I'm in my way, my ego, and that edges God out. And so these are things that I've learned. Um, so what I think about you is really none of my business. It's none of my business. But what I think about myself is a big deal. It's a huge deal. And on the flyer, it also said that I'm a leukemia uh, survivor. I don't really like to say I'm a survivor, and I'll tell you why. Um, I think we're all survivors in life, you know, and I think being a cancer survivor is, it's not much different than being a survivor of the war, you know. Um, it's just a different thing that happened in life. It's a different circumstance. and. Um, but what it gave me was a life and death experience. And that was really, uh, that was really changing for me. Um, I really changed uh, even before I got here. I was less dependent. Uh, I was uh, asserting myself in the hospitals with staff that I felt like I wasn't getting, uh, they weren't co being congruent maybe with what the doctor had said. And I would, I would uh, say something, you know, nicely. Um, but I learned to stand up for myself because nobody else was in there. Nobody else was going to speak for me. I was alone. And so <clears throat> I can be in my power. I can discern for myself. I know my body better than anybody else, even maybe the doctor. And I can tell the doctor that I think things are, I know you say it's this and I understand and we've tried that, but I think there's something else going on. And I'm wondering if we could maybe try that again, maybe try that treatment again, because it helped me. And I've been able to do these things. Um, and I've been able to not be afraid to do that. And actually, the way that I did it, it's not what I say, it's how I say it. It really ended well. It really ended well. And I still have a relationship with the doctor, and, and I'm free to text him, and we text each other. I let him know how it's progressing and that it's working. It's antibiotics that I'm taking. 
Um, and, and he said, you know, you're right. You know, you need a repeat. And sometimes this happens. It's not a big deal. Uh, I'll kindly do it. But my initial reaction was to go into fight or flight. And I'll go get another doctor. Well, how do I even know if this one is going to even, I'm just already imagining that he's not doing this thing for me. He's not going to give me what I want. And I'm putting all this imagination into my thoughts. And now I'm reacting by doing the fight or flight. I'm just leaving. I'm going to go find another doctor. And so this is something that has been a repetitive uh, theme in my life, uh, the fight or flight, and I flee. And imagine that in this study, I found out that fleeing is being a coward. I didn't like that. I do not like that. Being a coward? <laughs> oh, my gosh. That was the worst. <laughs> but then I had to really understand it, that I am my own worst enemy right here. All these my mind is my own worst enemy or my own best friend. And so um, sometimes I just have to give it to my higher power, you know, and say, uh, help. <laughs> I'm drowning again. You know, I'm in the boat and it's about to capsize. You know, I'm back in my uh, back in my flaws again, my character defects or whatever you want to call them, my vices. And I'm going to sink. And, uh, and you know, what happens is God doesn't always show up in the way I think he's going to show up. It can be through the study. It can be through something I read spiritually. And there's the answer. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, there it is, you know. And if I take that and I use it and I think of myself as a great soul, a spiritual being of light, um, an empowered soul, then I use it. I use those spiritual weapons. Um, there's also a saying in spirituality that you're a spiritual warrior. You're on a path. You need to get scarred up quite a few times. You might fall down, but you're not going to die. And you just get up and dust yourself off and keep moving forward. And I really like that. I really like that. Um, So oh, as soon as I think I'm going to get my power from other people or from approval or from coffee, because that's my thing, coffee, or anything else, then I might be entering into a territory that might lead me to some harm. <laughs> because there's nothing wrong with coffee um, in my in my eyes, um, I I have a cup of coffee every morning before I meditate because it makes me more alert. I just do. And I don't mind uh, admitting that. But when I think I can't live without that coffee and I can't meditate without that coffee, then it becomes a problem. It has a stronghold on me. That's where I cross the line. So I just have to be aware, is there anything that's stealing my joy? Is it stealing my peace of mind to come into that awareness, to stay in that awareness, to stay awake, wake up, wake up. When I think that you, what you think is going to make me happy, then I need to wake up. Um, because you know what? There's always going to be someone that says some unkind words at some moment. But I should be able to just uh, get to the point where I let that go. It doesn't impact me anymore. I'm not quite there, but I'm further along. <laughs> and the fears. Oh, my Lord, the fears. That's the poison. And the feelings of death. The fears of not having enough money, the fears of getting something and losing it, um, the fears that someone is trying to take something from me. Um, there's been times in the spiritual path that maybe I got some type of service and someone else said, why did she get that? 
<laughs> she got that because she has a PhD. That's why she got it. You know, inside, I didn't say anything, but I was reacting like crazy. I was like, that's such a mean thing to say. You know, why can't she just tell me she's happy for me? This is a spiritual program. They say we're supposed to be well-wishers and have pure feelings. And I'm just judging and criticizing all over the place. And um, so, again, it goes back to my pride. And I'm giving you a script that you need to follow. It's my script on what you should be saying, what you shouldn't be saying to me. And it's going back to that feeling of low self-worth and low self-esteem. And maybe she's right. Maybe she's right. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this service. Maybe I'm not good enough. And maybe she could do it better. And when I get to that, oh, my Lord. That's really like gritty, you know, that's really like something I've got to let go of um, because I'm totally handing over my power <laughs> and saying, just let me drink a little bit more poison. Let me harm myself. Let me make myself feel a little bit more unworthy. You know, it's nothing to do with that person. It's what I've already, it's what's already inside of me from way back, way back. Um, so I've got to pull that out slowly and gently. And if I don't get that root out the first time, I've got to do it again and again until more through different people, through different places, through different things. Because if I don't get to the root of it, it reappears again and again until I've defeated that monster. So it's a good thing to uh, be aware of. It's a deep, rooted feeling and sometimes it comes out in dreams and dreams are very effective tools if you can look at your dreams and get some kind of meaning because dreams are never presented like you know it can be a snake but it's not really a snake it's something that that snake represents um if you can really get down to it they can be very helpful tools and i think dreams present themselves when you're ready, when you're ready to deal with it, you're ready to start dealing with it. And I don't think dreams are always a bad thing. I think they can be indicative of something that you need to deal with and you're ready for it. The warrior is ready. Pick up the weapons and move forward, get on with it. Um, so I don't make you my God. <laughs> and God says I'm one. <laughs> So I can't make you my God. I can't make you my higher power. I can't get my power from you because that's not a good thing to do. And I have to be tolerant. I don't have to be, but I have a desire to be tolerant, to be patient, and to rid myself of that negative energy drop by drop. And if I'm getting greedy, it's because I want a little bit more approval. Like you've been telling me, oh, Kim, you're doing good service. Oh, Kim, you're, you're changing. You're getting, oh, you're steady. You're a good student. And then I want a little bit more, want a little bit more. You know, that's being greedy. And so that, that will get me into trouble. <laughs> um, so I think that's about all just to, to stay alert and to be aware is to not forget who I am. I'm not this body. I'm not these relationships. And my primary relationship is with God because he's the one that's the great physician and he knows what to do to help me. And uh, that's really something I need to keep in mind. He's the great psychologist. That's it. You know, he knows the blind spots and he knows my weaknesses and my flaws, even if I can't always see them. And he's very patient. He's very patient. Um, so I was wondering, is anybody want to share, uh, perhaps um, if you're comfortable, maybe something, one thing that came up for you? Um, or maybe something that a drop 
some insight that you were inspired by? I love groups. I've always worked in groups. Um, I've always done group therapy because I think that that having a um, powerful uh, community is very healing. And I think the vibration is very powerful. And I think that we can't really hide as well in a group as we can individually, one-on-one. -on -one. You know, we can manipulate a little bit. We can say nice things. But in a group, it tends to be like, wow, I see myself. You're like a mirror, you know? It just, uh, it's funny how God kind of puts us in different groups so that we can work on our weaknesses. So with that, I'll... Brother, do you want to ask if there's any questions or? Okay. First of all, thank you, Sister Kim, for taking, giving us that deep understanding of uh, why we hold on to different emotions. But uh, didn't you all feel that power in that talk, right? That, that was amazing. Um, I have unmuted everyone, so if you would like to share, and I saw many hearts during the talk, and it was, I was just counting, and it was amazing to see that. So you can all unmute and talk, ask question, uh, share insight, if you, if you know. I'm, I'm kind of burning to talk. <laughs> Because I, I relate to the emotional part, and I'm sorry that I missed the first part, but um, I'm wondering how you, sometimes I project onto God, my emotional thing, and, you know, he says to have all relationships with him, and then I can get a little frustrated because he's not being the husband I want him to be, or whatever it is, um, and I get can get, my emotions can get I can be projecting my thing onto him or I'll take something that is said spiritually in the spiritual studies, I'll take it to heart in the wrong way. And so that's been like quite something that I've had to deal with over the years and has been a trip up for me. So I'm wondering what you may have already talked about and I missed the beginning, but... <clears throat> I could also relate to the youth, the the story that you were talking about, because I used to be a youth worker in a foster home and it was very traumatic to see the young people, what they had been through so much already in their lives. But anyway, that's beside the point. But yeah. So from what I have experienced is when something is hitting me through a spiritual reading or something standing out, or it doesn't feel good. Um, sometimes um, I will go and um, pursue a, a different perspective because we all turn differently. And sometimes um, uh, things that are explained by one teacher is a different take on it than another. And it may be a, coming from a little bit more religious um, so I try to get an accurate, uh, sometimes a translation on like, can you tell me from the, you know, translation, is this, am I hearing it right? Was it translated right? Because this sounds like a little, hmm, <laughs> I don't really feel that God is this way. So can you kind of explain to me a little bit, um, or is it me, you know? Um, and and I would say that most of the time, it's the explanation. Um, so that's what I do for myself. Um, so because I want to get it accurately, because I want to heal. And I want to know God as he is. Um, and so uh, I already know the fearful God, you know the God that's going to punish me, like I hear of Dharam Raj. Well, it was explained to me that we 
feel the emotions. And so it's not God doing it to us. It's just allowing us to learn from it. And it goes by that fast. And I only know that from near-death experiences. Um, that's something that I'm fascinated with. Because when I was facing death and I was um, faced with the possibility that the treatment wouldn't work, um, that I would be seeing my maker or whatever you want to call him. You know, at the time I was religious, so I thought I'd be going home to my maker is what I thought because I was, you know, following that path. And what came to me is I can't let go of this thing and it's really bothering me I can't go home and face him with I can't forgive this person you know and and so I just know that through talking to an actual Catholic um, chaplain that she explained to me that God doesn't fault you for that but you need to let go of that for yourself is poisoning you. It's not poisoning God. You know, God is carrying on quite well without you, but you are causing yourself harm by carrying that. Are you really ready to let it go? I said, I am. And so, you know what? I, I learned from that, that, yeah, it's, it's me, it's me that like you say, sometimes we project or, or something from our religion or our childhood or something. It's, it's not quite accurate the way it's explained. Um, because God is actually giving us these beautiful tools to free us, to free ourselves and to love ourselves and to find that self-worth and to be honest. That's how I feel God is. And I've had an experience twice with the light. And I never found him to be doing a Dom, Dom Ram, I can't even say it right, Dom Raj or uh, condemning me or criticizing me. Now, I won't say that he, things will not, um, you know, I had a I had an incident where I, uh, I went off the road. I was coming, I was working three to 11 as a nurse and I was tired and I fell asleep for just a moment and I went off the road. I lost total control of my car. And I was spinning out of control. I couldn't get the wheel back. I couldn't get, I just couldn't, the car was totally um, out of control. And I had a one of those, uh, like a movie. Everything went in front of me really fast. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna hit a, a post and I'm gonna die. That's it, lights out. It was so fast, but it was kind of like uh, nothing significant, but it was kind of like, I, I kind of think that's the way it's going to be is like, it's just going to be so fast, but it's going to reveal something to us that we need to know our soul needs to learn from to progress. That's, uh, that's kind of what I think. And I think God's doing that with us now. He's giving us a chance to do that now. You know, he's saying, look, just get honest. You know, if you did something wrong, just just uh, deal with it. Don't and don't feel that guilty. You know, let it go. And come on, you got to move to the next moment. And um, I mean, unless you murder somebody, you know, and <laughs> you know, I've even had people confess that, you know, for what they were locked up for was not everything they did. And um, I felt that in that moment that I didn't need to judge them or criticize them, you know? Um, so well, I think we know, we know it as parents, right? As being a parent, we know that love, unconditional love feeling, and we get it from God, I, I feel. But sometimes it can <laughs> get, sometimes it, it's not always... Our own stuff gets in the way, like you were saying. Our own stuff gets in the way and our own shame, our own feelings of low self-worth. And I think that, you know, you bring up the parent and um, I, the way I can look at God and me as a child, you as a child, of you um, as children of God is um, my own children. And, um, you know, um, they turn to both the streets. They've, they've both been on the streets. They've done criminal activity. They got locked up for it. They've both done time for that as juveniles. 
but my God, they're beautiful men today. They're working. They're not hurting people. They're not in that lifestyle. They left that lifestyle a long time ago. Um, they can talk to anybody. They can be with anybody. They can, you know, they've, they can talk to different cultures, different lifestyles. I mean, because they don't have that stereotype that blocks them so much that maybe another kid that lives in this neighborhood would that's never experienced that and and I don't see them as that person I know a lot of what they've done it wasn't good <laughs> but I don't see them as that person anymore and I don't really think about it and I think that's how God is you know he just says you're not that now so let it go drop that rock, move on with it because you were, you have that experience so that you can help somebody else. Not everybody can understand that lifestyle. And a lot of people will condemn you for being in that. So, um, yeah, God, God gives each one of us a gift to be there for different people and to not be hard on ourselves. And and I think that maybe what you're talking about is our spiritual study and, um, and that when you hear something that may be a little offensive, you ask yourself, is God really like that? Is that what it's really saying to me? And then find somebody with a lot of years who can give you some insight. Thank you. And thanks for being vulnerable too. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I don't want to be afraid of, you know, things that come up. I mean, I've been on fourth street and meditation and service and white uniform. And I've had two people walk in that knew me that from that knows what has happened in my family knew me from way back. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I just wanted to hide. Oh no. Oh no. What is sister going to think of me? Oh no. Now she's going to know. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, come on, I, I it's just got to stop. <laughs> it's between, you know, it's what he thinks about me. <laughs> so. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your, it's, it's, I, I know what you're talking about. I think those, oh. <laughs> Those moments of, oh no. <laughs> and most of the time, that's not what it is. <laughs> that is kind of so, oh, I must be that one. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, you know what I mean. Or, you know, like seeing status <laughs> instead of stage, you know, my yeah, stage. Yeah. Anyway, I want to give it over to other people. So I don't want to take over. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I just want to add something that I just came up in my mind. Uh, sister, when you were talking about the murdering others, and I thought about how about murdering yourself? <laughs> we do that every time. <laughs> yes. yeah, murdering your conscience. Your yourself conscience. every day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have Sister Alicia. If you would like to, Sister Alicia, if you would like to unmute and talk, because you have your comment here too. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Um, I was really struck by so many things that were brought up. Um, I'm working on my master's. I'm a substitute teacher. And it's so funny. Uh, there's so many points that I want to touch on that Kim had spoke about. But um, the biggest one, I guess, just trying to absorb what you're trying to teach is that um, there's a specific school that I teach at in a specific neighborhood where the children, the majority of the children are challenging because I understand it's because of their circumstances. So I was there today and I told myself, I'm gonna exclude the school. I'm not gonna take any more jobs. And then as we were talking, a job popped up and I'm trying to save a home for a home, which in this economy, you know, anyway. Um, so I was like, okay, great. Oh, it's on Friday. I'm available. Cool. Um, and after I accepted it, 
it was this school and I just hear you saying like, be awake. You know what I'm saying? This God sent me this to teach me my lesson of patience and humility because man, today I couldn't wait to get out of there. And <laughs> that really spoke of my immaturity. Um, and also, I think it's also so wonderful that you found a doctor that listens to you. I'm having such a hard time and I'm trying to advocate for myself. Luckily, I have a counselor who I can talk with and we've, um, he's helped me through so much trauma, which I wanted to br bring up, I think is a, a cool little statement he had told me um, is there's capital T trauma, which is car accidents, um, life and death situations, um, such and such that are, you know, can really cause symptoms of PTSD and uh, major triggers, but there's also a lowercase trauma that can happen over time, an extended period of time, and it still affects you. You might not be able to pinpoint exactly what happened in your life to, to make you feel this way, to cause this feeling, but it could be multiple things over many, many moments in your life that have caused you to become triggered by certain things, um, become triggered by that stupid guy who cut you off or the lady who's going five miles an hour in a 35. I digress. But um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for open, not only opening up, but um, and being vulnerable, like um, the other person said, but it was so pers personable. And sometimes I feel like I'm alone and um, I won't get too far into it because I know I've taken up enough time already, but I, I do suffer from mental illness and um, there's such a stigma behind that. And, you know, I feel like I have to hide a part of myself from even the people that I'm closest with. And for once in a group of strangers, I feel like I can be 100% open um, with God's blessing of, of telling what's on my heart and have it being reciprocated. So I just want to say thank you so much. And I, I definitely hope to join another one of these meetings. I would say to you, thank you so much for your sharing and for your openness. And um, that's awesome. Yeah, thank you. And it's one thing is these are universal teachings and they're for everyone and they're not my teachings, but thank you. <laughs> I'm just a messenger, but um, they're teachings that go way back uh, ancient teachings of spirituality and they're to give you freedom and find your joy in life and to just love yourself exactly as you are and be firm in that because you are a child of God designed to be on a path and everything and I think that everything in life, if when we can accept it, then we don't fight it anymore. And it's beautiful and it's exactly the way it's designed to be. But thank you again. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, such deep understanding of this, uh, how we hold on to uh, many, many things and such simple answer, such simple answer. So let us just uh, experience the essence of this teaching. Just be silent. Be awake. and look inside. 
under the outward covers which are very uncomfortable, hurting. Go at the core, which is untouched by all the painful past experiences. Look at your beautiful self. And believe that that's real you. Now that form fit. Let everything else blur out. And let God's light come in and let his might come in and dissolve everything, make you light. Thank you once again. Thank you for joining, making it very meaningful and interactive. We will be meeting again next Tuesday. Om Shanti.